Thank you. Um, yeah, so as Christian said, I'll present uh, Gearbox to you in this joint work with uh, Bernardo David, Bernardo Michael, Jesper, Bruce Nielsen, and uh, Daniel Schuli. And so this is a talk about uh, sharding. And so I assume most of you know what, what sharding is and why it's useful, but just to make clear that we are all on, on the same page, I'll give a short introduction of uh, what it is and, and why it is useful. So if you have a blockchain that does not use sharding, like uh, Bitcoin, for example, the, I mean, the very rough high level idea of, of how this works is that you start with a Genesis block, and you have a set of nodes, and then I mean, there's some way to, to select a node who will then make a block dependent to the, to the Genesis block and include transactions in this block. And then all the other nodes will verify this block. And then this process just keeps repeating. There will be now uh, possibly different node uh, chosen to make another block. And uh, then again, everybody else will verify this block and so on and so forth. Right? And so this means if we now double the number of nodes we have in the system, uh, this will not change how the protocol works, right? There's still one node being selected and everybody else will verify um, that block, right? And so this means that all nodes will verify um, all the blocks, right? And um, so what, what this means is basically if you keep increasing the number of nodes, this will uh, increase the security because now you will need to basically compromise more nodes to, to bring the system down, but it will not increase the efficiency. Right? In fact, it will decrease the efficiency because of overheads in the protocol. And I mean, increasing security is of course uh, very good, but at some point it's also enough, right? You probably don't need 10,000 nodes to verify the same block. And that's why uh, the idea of sharding is to distribute the nodes into different uh, sets. So in this example, we just split them into a top and, and into a, a bottom set, and then they essentially run their own blockchain. And internally, these shards work like the normal blockchain, like very, very simplified way. So there will be one um, node selected in, in each of these uh, subsets, and making a block, and then only the nodes in that particular subset will verify that block. Right? So you essentially can then uh, like double the throughput, uh, at least ideally, right? Because you have now um, parallelized this this whole verification and, and block proposal uh, process. Right? This means if you use sharding, you can increase the the performance with increasing number of nodes. All right, so that's that's the motivation and and what we want. And if you look at um, existing sharding solutions, again at a very high level, they essentially work in, in, in the same way. I think examples of, of uh, uh, papers that, that consider sharding, uh, for example, Elastico, Omniledger, or, or Rapid Chain, and, and what they all do is that they basically randomly assign nodes to the to these different shards, and then within the shards, they just run a essentially normal consensus algorithm. And this random assignment here is important, so you cannot let nodes choose in which shard they want to go. Because if you do that, then all malicious nodes can go into the same shard, and then you would have too much corruption in a shard. And what too much means then depends a bit on, on the model you're in. So there's essentially two, two worlds you can consider. If you're like in, in Bitcoin in a synchronous setting, then you can tolerate uh, up to 49% corruption. But um, so synchronous means you need to know uh, an upper bound on the network delay. Right. And if, if the network delay is actually slower than what you expect, then the protocol will break. Right. And partially synchronous or even asynchronous uh, protocols, they don't need to know such an upper bound, but they can only tolerate uh, less than a third corruption. And basically everything I'm talking about can be applied in both uh, settings, but I will focus on the partially synchronous uh, setting because that's um, probably what, what you want for sharding. It's also the more, more challenging setting. So we'll always consider the setting where you can only tolerate less than a third corruption. All right, so, so that, that's the very high level uh, idea. And of course, there are many technicalities, maybe issues uh, you have to solve in, in sharding, but at a very high level, that, that's, that's how all the things work. And also what, what I should mention when, when I say less than a third corruption, if you're in a permissionless setting, 
um, you, you cannot just have like one third counting the number of servers, right? Because someone can just spin up a million nodes on, on Amazon. So you could easily get the majority of the numbers. So you need to have some uh, way to, to bind your protocol to a resource that is hard to clone. That's a Bitcoin, this is proof of work. We will uh, focus on proof of stake for, for efficiency. So whenever I say that, for example, 10% need to do something that always means weighted by the stake. Right? So I, I will not uh, go into details of how, how you do this, but I mean, there are also many existing approaches. A very simple one um, is, is called like follow the, the Satoshi. So Satoshi is, is also the smallest uh, unit in, in Bitcoin. And what, what you can do basically, if you instead of selecting a random node, you can select a random coin and then the, the meaning of that is that the owner of that particular coin is the, the node you selected. Right? And by doing this, you basically can do a selection that's proportional to the stake the nodes have. But there are also other approaches, but yeah, I, I will not talk about this further. And another thing I don't really want to talk about is how to generate this randomness for, for assigning the chance. This is also basically a topic in itself, and there are different papers that uh, discuss different approaches on what to do. And I mean, essentially, with, with our uh, setting, you can use most of these approaches. It doesn't really matter much. So it, examples of, of existing um, protocols that, that all essentially run some, some multi-party protocol among these nodes to guarantee that you get some, some random output that you can use for the, the node assignment without malicious parties being able to um, influence this randomness too much. Um, so examples are, for example, a round hound, sorry, rent hound, which is the one used by, by Omni Ledger. There's also Scrape and then more recently uh, Albatross. And so in, in the paper, we use the formalization from Albatross, but it's, it's not really important. We just assume for, for this talk that there is some randomness that, that everybody can access and everybody agrees on, on which randomness it is. All right, so what I do want to talk about is how do you can uh, ensure the security within the shards. Right, so that, that is uh, obviously important. And as I said, in a partially synchronous setting, you need that in all, all the shards, you have less than a third corruption. And now if you select the, the parties in the shards randomly, how can you guarantee that it is always less than a third corruption? And uh, the basic idea of, of how this could work is that you need to assume in the total population, like strictly less corruption, say 30%. And that means if you now select a random subset, the expected corruption in that subset will also be 30%. Right? That's, that's easy to see. And now if, if all the numbers are, are large enough, that right, you can use this, this uh, bounds from, from probability theory, like the, the Chernoff bound, and will tell you that the, uh, the actual corruption will be close to this, this expectation with high probability. Right? And, and what, how close and how high the probability depends on how big the numbers are. But, but at least asymptotically, you, you can, can use these bounds. Um, but I mean, if, if we want to be practical, we, have, we also have to think about, okay, well, what are real numbers, right? No, not just asymptotically, but what, how, how many concretely do we need to choose? Right? And, and that is essentially the main uh, innovation of, of the paper to, to kind of um, optimize this, this number, right? Because if, if you now look at, at, at this example, say we have 10,000 nodes in total uh, and 30% corruption, and we want that except with probability two to the minus 60, less than a third are corrupted in, in, in the subset, what is the smallest subset that, that will give you that guarantee? Right? And the answer is it's more than 6,300, right? And um, I mean, that, that is a huge number, right? This is not really practical. I mean, you see that that's more than half of, of the total population, which is already big. So this is, this is far from practical, right? So you, you, you don't want to do that. So how can you bring this number down? And I mean, one obvious thing that you can now say is, yeah, I mean, this 30% and, and one third, this is too close to each other, right? If, if you want to, to do something more reasonable, you probably can not tolerate 30% in total, but maybe a bit less, right? That's for example, also in the, if you look at the Omni Ledger paper, in, in the examples they have, I think they also only consider up 25% corruption, Right, because just that the numbers get unreasonable if you have, have more corruption. And you could also say maybe 60-bit security is 
it's nice, but maybe also a bit less is acceptable. And you can again play with the numbers. For example, if, if you do this 25% and you say 40 bit security is enough for you, then you still need more than 1,300 nodes. Right? So it's it's much better, but it's still this is not what not what you want, right? It's it's not really uh, practical. Right? So if, if you run some some BFT with uh, more than 1,000 nodes, it it is not not very efficient. All right. So what what we want ideally, right? what 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 uh, the dream goal would be that we can be really fast, like much smaller shards, maybe le less than 100 nodes. And we do not want to compromise security, right? We want to ideally have up to 30% uh, corruption in the total population and, and still be, be fast. So can we do that? And well, if, if we fix the 60-bit the security and the 30% uh, overall corruption, there's only one parameter left to, to play with. And that is how much corruption you can tolerate within a shard. And then you can here see a plot of a graph that's on, on the x-axis basically telling you how much uh, corruption you can tolerate in a shard. And the y-axis tells you how big the shards need to be to, to give this guarantee with probability uh, 2 to the minus 60. And you see at, at the rightmost uh, corner, there is um, essentially this uh, one third, which gives you a number more than 6,000. But if, if you increase the allowed corruption, this graph is dropping quite fast, right? So if you're uh, like 44%, for example, it's, it's already below 1,000 and it, it keeps decreasing quite fast. So if, if you could allow more corruption, then you could have much smaller shots, right? which is not surprising, but now you're probably thinking, okay, that, that's nice and good, but uh, we need less than a third corruption, right? otherwise it's, it's not secure, right? And um, I mean, that that is true, but not completely true, because what we can now do is we can bring in this safety liveness uh, dichotomy, which is uh, mentioned in the title. And the idea there is that the security you can split into two properties. You can look at the safety and liveness separately. Right? And safety means basically you don't make mistakes. So you will never confirm conflicting blocks. And liveness means you keep running. Right? So if, if you submit a transaction, it will eventually get uh, included. And you can now have uh, two parameters, S and L, which will tell you how much corruption you can tolerate um, such that the safety uh, or the liveness is still guaranteed. Right? So if you have, have a, a protocol with the parameter um, S, then this, this means that as long as there's at most S corruption, the protocol will be safe, right? similarly for L. So that, that's the, what you can define and now what, what you can uh, prove is that in the partially synchronous setting, um, basically this works if and only if you have uh, two L plus S less than one, and then the synchronous setting L plus S less than one. Right? So the synchronous, as I said before, we don't really consider here, but if, if you now in, look at this um, inequalities and plug in the, the numbers you know, right? the, the one third, for example, for the partially synchronous, then this is exactly what you get if you insist that L and S are equal, right? Because if you say I want both, I, I want to have safety and liveness, which is uh, reasonable, uh, of course, then you need uh, less than a third. And for the uh, synchronous, uh, it's a half. All right. And um, now how, how is this useful, right? And you, you want normally um, both things. And, and also, I mean, how, how do you have a consensus that, that uses these bounds. And then so first at a very high level, I, I, I will show you how you can have a consensus algorithm that, that works with different bounds for, for S and L. Um, and, it, and this is just the, the high level idea. So assume you already have your favorite consensus algorithm that, that works normally with like equal parameters. And now you can just modify it slightly by saying to confirm a block, you now require one minus L signatures, where L is this life key, uh, liveness threshold. And then you also make sure that honest parties never sign conflicting blocks, which they probably already don't do. And, and this modification is essentially enough to, to kind of treat these parameters. Right? To, to see why we have a liveness if there's less than L corruption. Um, less than L corruption just means that basically 
there's at least one minus L honest party, right? And so this is how many signatures we can um, require, right? So this this does not track uh, liveness if if you uh, require this many signatures, right? So that's that's quite easy to see. More interesting, uh, a bit more difficult also is to see why we have a safety up to parameter s in this setting. And so to see this, we start with again this uh, inequality, this 2l plus s less than 1. Right? So the idea is that here this the whole box is 100%, and this this white uh, space, this is basically the less than 1. Right? There, there's something left in addition to 2l plus 1. And now, if if you assume there is um, a violation of safety, that means we have two blocks that are in conflict to each other, and both of them have um, at least one minus L signatures. Right? And now, if you look at the sets of parties who made these two signatures, if you adjust them in, into this uh, this illustration, then you see that the overlap of these two sets must be larger than S, right? because of this this wide gap. It's strictly more than S. So that means in this situation, there must be more than S um, parties who signed both blocks. Right? But now if we assume that we have less, uh, sorry, at most S corruption, that implies that there must be an honest party who signed both blocks. Right? And that's, of course, a contradiction to, to our protocol. And that means that we have safety as long as S is uh, less than, the, sorry, the corruption is less than S. Right. So um, this is basically how you can get a protocol, and you can also prove that this is uh, optimal. Right? So you can achieve this if and only if you have this uh, 2L plus S less than 1. All right. So now, if, if you have such a protocol, now how can you use this? I mean, wh wh why is this uh, useful? Now, an ob observation is, what, what does it mean to have 30% uh, corruption? Right. I mean, this is something that you want to tolerate in case someone is mounting an attack, right? It is kind of the worst case. If, if someone is really spending resources to attack you, you, you want to assume that he can at most acquire, say, like 30% of the stake, for example, and you, you want to be safe in this case, right? But I mean, hypothesis here is that typically there will be less corruption, right? So you will not always have like 30% corruption all the time. And now, the, the, the hope is that if you have less corruption, right, then in this op optimistic case, you can be faster. Right? So you always want to be uh, safe, basically. Right? But if, if there's less corruption in the worst case, you can exploit this to be faster. Right? And the way to do this is now to, to use this gearbox. Right? So you have here like a, a six gear shift, like a, a good uh, manual car. Right? And you can here basically define different shard sizes for, for all six gears, right? So you can say the first gear, for example, has 1,713 uh, nodes. And um, so why why this number? If, if you look back at, at this graph, I mean, you don't really see it, but you can believe me that the 39, um, basically 39% allowed corruption uh, precisely corresponds to then this number shard size of 1,713, right? And, and so what, what this means is that if, if you pick a, a random shard with that size, you will, and, and you, you run a consensus protocol with the parameter S set to 39%, uh, it will always be safe, right? You will never violate safety except with probability 2 to the minus 60, right? And then we can set L to be just the, the largest value that still satisfies this 2L plus S less than 1, right? So 30% in, in this example. And then what this means is that, I mean, you may not be live, right? But if the overall uh, corruption is at most L, then you can expect to be live, right? So there's a good chance that you are live. And you see, I mean, here we, we assume overall anyway at most 30% corruption. So even in the first year, you are already significantly smaller shard than the, the more than 6,000 in, in the all, always live setting. And we are still always safe and can expect to be live. Right? And, and you see this gets, gets this, the shards get much smaller if you now keep increasing um, this S and decreasing the L. For example, in the sixth gear, where you only have 51 shards, you can do this now extremely efficiently. right? And you will 
again, always be uh, safe. And if you have less than 5% corruption, you will also be live with a good chance, right? And maybe in practice, you, you may often be in a situation with at most 5% corruption. That, that's maybe not, not completely unreasonable. Okay, but now again, there's a problem, right? That you, I mean, you, you want to be live, right? You, you don't want to be maybe live, right? And also you don't know how much corruption you have. So you, you don't know in which gear you should shift, right? So that, that seems to be an issue that, that you don't, you don't know the, the corruption. And for that, the idea is that um, we, we can use a, a control chain that is, is basically just a special shard that is run slowly. This is now with the parameter S and L set to one third. So this will always be live and always safe, but it will be very slow. Right? So this, this you can run with like the, the 6,000 nodes, a really slow but very secure chain. And then in addition to that, you run all the shards in different gears, right? And you can start them up in the, the sixth gear, very aggressive and hope that they will be live. And then what the protocol will do, you basically just select now this, this 51 uh, nodes, for example, in the first shard, and they will run this chain. And then in this example, every three blocks, they will send a heartbeat back to the control chain, which means they can basically just post this one minus L signatures required to confirm a block um, on, on the control chain. So this, this basically tells now everybody that there, there is progress happening on, on this shard. Right? And so you continue like this and all the the shards basically do the same thing, sending heartbeats every three blocks in this example. The three is just now an arbitrary uh, example. Right? And then what, what is interesting now, what can happen is that there, there can be a shard now that just fails to produce more blocks, right? So there's a safety, so it's safety holes, right? Because we have always have safety, but there's now a liveness uh, violation. And this can happen. And down the control chain, you see that there should have been by now a heartbeat of, after four, four blocks of the control chain because that is running much slower, but there, there is nothing. So you can detect this. Right? So that's the first step. You can detect that liveness does not hold. And so now the, the last missing piece is to fix it. Right? So you know, you know that there's a problem. Now you want to resolve the deadlock. Right? And the way you can do that is basically you, you have to restart the shard and you want to do two things, right? You want to shift down the gear. So you now want to increase the, the size of the shard to make sure that you have now a better chance of, of getting an, a, a live um, committee. And you may also want to increase the timeout because another reason for timing out could be that the timeout was too small, especially in the partially synchronous setting. You don't even know how long it takes to transmit a heartbeat. I mean, in practice, that's, that's, that's less of an issue, but you essentially, these, these are the two reasons why, why it could have timed out. But then now there's one complication in, in the restarting, and that is basically you need to, the, the new people who now start a new shard, they need to all have an agreement on what is the state of the shard that deadlocked. Right? And so what we'll do, that um, basically in the example here, there was one heartbeat in, for the green blocks, and then there were two more blocks, and then there was a deadlock, right? And what will be difficult is to, to have an agreement on these two gray blocks, because may, some people may have seen them, some people not, but it, it's unclear, but everybody can agree on the green blocks because there was this, the signatures on, on the control chain and everybody can see the control chain and there, there's already an a, agreement on this. So what you can do is you can start the, the shard again with a new committee and basically just remove these two gray blocks and start again from the, from the green ones, right? And then hopefully you have uh, shifted into a good gear and it will keep running and everything is working well. And then if not, you just have to, to shift down again. Right? And then the idea is that over time you, you find a good uh, shard size. Right? And again, since you never violate safety, you can also use some heuristics here and, and try to find some, some good gear and maybe also shift up again if, if it uh, works well and, and so on. And so that's, that is the, the basic idea. And so to, to conclude, what uh, our approach allows you is to run like uh, shards that are very small, that are always safe and maybe live if you have chosen good parameters. And you can use a control chain that is always live and safe to detect if, if the uh, liveness does not hold and you can restart the shards again in a lower gear until you have a liveness. And this means optimistically, you can have much smaller shards. 
which can give you much better efficiency if you have less than the worst case corruption. And then, so what I did not talk about here, but what you can see in the papers, also a formalization in UC of, of our protocols where we prove everything um, that is composably secure. And we also discuss a bit inter transactions. Thank you.